Hey man, God's good. All the time. God's good. I'm going to go. I'm going to go to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Amen. Hope you have your word with you today, the sword of the Lord. And I have been calling this, and I believe this is our war manual. This is our manual for the battlefield. And like any soldier, we need to know what our manual says so that we can win not just the fight, not just the battle, but the war that Satan is waging against us. Proverbs chapter 4, starting in verse 20. There are four things there I want you to see. Four things that we should do. God says this. If God said it, we should do it. Amen. Number one, he says, give attention or pay attention to my words. Amen. Number two, incline your ear to my sayings. What is he saying to you? Get them into your ears. And then number three, do not let them depart from your sight. Number four, keep them in the midst of your heart. Why do we do this? Why? Because this is important. It's something that we all want, not just for ourselves, but for those we love as well. We want health and healing. What does Jesus say? What does God say? They are life to those who find them and health to all our body. You know, the Hebrew, it means this, that these are living words. These are not dead words on a page. They're living and active. And when you take them into you, when you digest them, when you get them inside of you, when you make them a part of you, when they flow from your heart into your bloodstream, they are health to your whole body. They are springs of living water. Now, let's be real. Every single one of us has taken a prescription medication at one time or another. Do you know that in the last 30 days, 49% of all people in the United States have taken at least one prescription medication? That's a lot. One out of every two have taken some kind of prescription medicine in the last 30 days. 25% of everybody in the U.S. has taken at least three or more prescription medications in the last three days, 30 days. And almost 15% have taken five or more prescription medications in the last 30 days. That's a lot. Physicians write an average of 2,000 plus prescriptions every single month. According to the National Center for Health Statistics, if you are older than 60, John, this is not you. If you are older than 60, 88% of those over 60 are taking at least one medication. 88%. And 13% are taking at least five or more prescription medications. That's a lot. That's a lot. One-third, let me go back, one-third of those over 60 are taking five or more medications. And if you're over 60, one of the medications you're most likely taking is something for cholesterol or lowering your blood pressure. If you're taking medication and you're between 20 and 60, you're most likely taking an antidepressant. It's the top-written medication on the market today. Over 145 million prescriptions are written for depression every single year. $12 billion in sales. It's interesting that when it comes to medical prescriptions, when you are feeling sick, when you're not well, and the doctor writes out something for you, isn't it incredible that you will go through any kind of weather to get that medication? You don't care if it's freezing out. You don't care if it's raining out. You don't care if it's snowing out. you got to get that medication because your life is on the line. If you don't take it, you can get worse. And then once you get that medication, you look at it and you follow it to the T. 
Well, I'm supposed to take this at night. You take it at night. I'm supposed to take it three times a day. You take it three times a day. You follow what the doctor says to a T. Am I lying or not? No, I'm telling you the truth. Every year, old drugs are replaced with new drugs. But one prescription that has never been replaced is this. The word of the Most High God. It has never been replaced. It, has, it is as good today as it has always been. Now let me tell you the advantages of God's prescription right here. First of all, you don't have to buy it. It's free. It's free. Number two, whatever sickness or disease you're suffering from, God's word can heal it. It is effective for any condition you might have. I remember one day when I was teaching on healing, I showed the slides of all the different sicknesses and diseases in the New Testament. And almost every single one that they have today, they had back then. Number three, you can take God's word as a medicine and you don't have to worry about overdose. There's no such thing as taking too much of God's word. Number four, if satisfactory results are not obtained right away, you can double the dosage. You can triple the dosage. Come on. But like any medication, it doesn't work if it's sitting on a shelf. You have to take it. You have to take it to be effective. And if it's taken according to directions, according to God's word, if you will follow God's directions as faithfully as you would follow the directions of any doctor out there, you will see incredible results. God's irrevocable and irrefutable words. God's covenantal words, words from a God who cannot lie, says that these words are life and health to your body. Life and health. I looked up those words in the Hebrew. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I know Greek. Hebrew, I'm not a scholar. I looked it up. Life, kaya, health, martipe. Well, what does that mean to you and I? It means that God's word is living and active. And when you read these words, when you believe these words, when you let God breathe these words back into you, and they become a part of you, they have the power to sustain your life. They have the power to quicken regenerate and restore and bring health where there is none right now and even give life where the doctors have pronounced death get into the word how many times are you reading the new testament how many times have you read in there this person was terminally ill and god through jesus turned it around that's why i said to you get into the book of john every time you see the word believe highlight it that's why I've said during the next several months, get into the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Every time you see healing, write the word healing on your paper, on the top of your Bible page, and then highlight it so you can see what I'm telling you is true. Again, like any medicine, this will not work if all you're doing is listening to a motivational sermon every Sunday. If that doctor says to you, if you take this, this is what's going to happen. It's going to get, listen, he can tell you all he wants to tell you until you get that medicine in you. It doesn't mean a thing. It means absolutely nothing. And that doctor could be the greatest doctor in the whole world. Hearing a motivational speech about healing is not going to do a thing for you unless you get this word into you. Listen to what God told Isaiah, Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, verses 10 to 11. I'm going to tell you, I believe in healing. This is what he told Isaiah, Isaiah 55, verse 10. He said, for just as the rain and the snow, just as the rain and the snow, snow fall from heaven and do not return without watering the earth, making it bud and sprout, and providing seed to sow and food to eat. What did God say? So also my word that goes forth out of my mouth. Here it is right here. This word is inspired by the Most High God. In the same manner, 
Also, my word that goes forth out of my mouth will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire for it to do and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. This is the power of God's word. I get excited about this. I don't sit at home and say, Joe, begin to hoop and holler. I don't do that. But I get into this word and I get excited. I want to tell you this, ladies and gentlemen. I want to tell you this without hesitation. No hesitation whatsoever. And without one iota of doubt in my mind. Having been anointed by the... I'm talking about me now. Having been anointed by the Holy Spirit as a minister of the Most High God. And a teacher of God's Word. And having studied this Word at least for 50 years. In depth. 50 years and having a thorough knowledge of the Greek which is the New Testament and having a thorough knowledge of the times of Jesus and also having a clear knowledge that to those who have been given much is expected God expects a lot out of me and also having this knowledge having this knowledge that I will one day stand before the Most High God and be judged for every single word I said to you because my judgment will be more severe than yours. That's why James said, let not many of you become teacher. I want to tell you this. I am totally and completely wholeheartedly convinced of this fact. God's will for you and I. God's will for his healing. For his children is healing. To be healed and made whole. Not just in the, in the spirit. But in the mind and in the body. And in the heart as well. And in our emotions. Yes. How do I know this? How can I even begin to count the multitude of ways I know this to be true? One of the names for God is this. And I always say this when I pray for people. His name is Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah Rapha. Which means the God who heals. Healing. Healing is what he is. Healing is what he does. He can't, cannot heal. If God had a business card, what would it say? I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the God who healeth thee. Has God changed his name? Has he? Is there anywhere in this word that says his name Rapha is no longer valid? Anywhere? Absolutely not. For God does not change and he is still the God who heals. When it comes to you and I, his children, did God not say in Jeremiah 29, my plans for you are good things and not bad things. My plans are to give you a future and a hope. Now, some of these cessationists out there, these what's God pastors, will tell you, well, that's not for you. That's for Jeremiah. That wasn't for you. Well, let me put it to you this way. They are indeed for you and I today, for every single one of us. They are unquestionably for you and I. How do I know that? Because God is not a respecter of persons. God is not a respecter of persons. God is not a respecter of persons. Psalm 33, 11 says this. The plans of God's heart, His counsel, and His purposes stand forever and are for all generations. That's what God's Word says. And that's how I know this is for you and I today. Did not God say in his word that he wants you to be in health and prosper as your soul prospers? Did he say that or did he not? He breathed it into existence for you and I. You are God's child. You are a child of the Most High God. Even before you saw the light of day, God says he knit you together in your mother's womb and formed your innermost being. You look in the mirror, you see your body, everything inside of you, God knit together. Every part of your body, God knit together. And the Bible says his eyes were upon you even when your body was still not formed. You are his child and the most high God says he has written all the days of your life in his book even before you were born. Now let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Nicole. This, what I'm going to say to you now, it, it amazes me. Does anyone in their right mind, the Brooklyn coming out here, 
Does anybody in their right mind believe that the God who paid so much attention to you before you were born is now going to ignore you and ignore your needs after you're born? Does that even make sense? Does anyone seriously think that God cares less for you now after you're born? He did so much work for you while you were in the womb. You think now he cares even less about you? Does anyone really believe God who gave you the miracle of life is now going to ignore you and turn his back on you when you're experiencing the trials and tribulations of life? Is not God, according to his holy, indisputable, and irrevocable word, is God not still Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides for you? Is he still, isn't he still Jehovah Shalom, the God who wants to give you not just peace, but wholeness? Yeah. Is he not Jehovah Shammah, the God who's there for you? He hasn't abandoned you? Yeah. Or is all that just words on paper, no more valid than yesterday's news? Come on! Yeah. Do you really think he's going to ignore you? Especially when you're going through a bad spell, a tough time, a diagnosis that's hard to bear. Just the opposite, guys. He wants to bless you. He wants to heal you. He why? Oh. Why is it? I'm going to use Gino for example. Gino, you look at your kids. And you go to the school and there's all these other kids. Why is it about your kid? That, that what's it about your child that makes them different than all the others? There's a part of you inside of them. There's a part of you. God wants to heal and bless you. Why? Because inside of you, when God looks at you, what does he see? He sees a part of him inside of you. And that's why he wants to bless you. Why did, what did God mean when he said... Cry on to me in your time of struggle, and I will deliver you from your distress. What did he mean by that? What did he mean? I am the God who heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. What, did he, what is he talking about? I am the Lord who healeth thee. I am the God who not only forgives your iniquities, but heals all of your diseases as well, who crowns your life with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies your life with good things. What is God talking about there? Listen to what God's holy and irrevocable and eternal word says. He is God. He is the great I am. He is not a man that he should lie. Nor is he a son of man that he should change his mind. Just the opposite. Healing is part and parcel of this new covenant. And God fulfills what he says Heaven and earth, Jesus said, will pass away. But my words will never pass away. Even the Apostle Paul said, why? Every single one of God's promises in Jesus Christ are white. Yes and amen. And amen means what? So be it. More than so be it, brother. The word amen comes from a combination of three words in the Hebrew. And it means our God is a faithful God. All of his promises are yes because our God is a faithful God. God's will for his children is healing, is deliverance, is freedom. Did not God send his son to pay the price not just for your sins, but for your sickness and diseases on, cross, on the cross of Calvary as well? I hope in your Bible, turn to Matthew 8. If you do not have this highlighted, underlined, star, do it now. This is your war manual. you got to know what I'm telling you here. Matthew 8, 16 and 17. Turn to it, highlight it, circle it, star it. Write the word healing at the top of your paper. <coughs> God sent his son to pay the price. Look what Matthew 8 Verse 16 says, When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to Jesus. And he drove out spirits with the word and healed all who were sick. All who were sick. 
diseased and infirm. Now ask the question, why did he do that? Why did he do that? The next verse tells you. To fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. Jesus didn't have to wait for the cross to provide healing. His whole life then and now is the devoted devoted for healing and saving and delivering. That's even before the cross. During his three years of ministry to man on earth, not once did Jesus say, sorry, can't heal you because this sickness is my Father's will for you. Never once did he say, sorry, my Father gave you that cancer to teach you something. Did you ever hear him say, I can't heal you. You're not good enough. You're not holy enough. You're not ready yet. Did Jesus ever refuse to heal? He never said, God is trying to teach you a lesson. And I've talked about this before because people always say, well, God is using this disease to teach me stuff. God's not using that disease. You are. Because before you came down with that sickness, disease, or infirmity, what is God doing? Even right now as I'm speaking these words, what is God doing in your life? He's trying to convict you and convince you and convert you to be more like Jesus, to have Jesus. That's what he's doing. That's what he's doing for people out there. But what are they doing? Ignoring him because what they want to do is more important than what God wants to them, them to do. But then, when they come diagnosed with something, what happens? They become a crisis Christian. Now, they ignored God for years and years. And now they're going to turn to God and say, heal me. So what are they doing? Is God using this? No, they are. Because the same thing God did before you found out you had that sickness is the same thing he's doing after you had that sickness. He's trying to convince you, convert you, and change your life to be more like his son Jesus and less like yourself. And I'm going to tell you something. I've, I've heard sermons by pastors like this. Well, you know, Paul had this thorn in the flesh, and that was really sickness and disease. That's stupidity. That thorn in the flesh were the people, his own brothers, who were persecuting him. The audaciousness of Bishop Spong from New Jersey, an Episcopal priest. The, not just the audaciousness, the stupidity of that bishop to say, well, you know what that thorn was? Paul was gay. Paul was homosexual. And God told him, well, you know, my grace is sufficient for you. You've got to live with it. I'm not kidding you. No, I'm you know, at that gym, I told you that. I told that guy about the four cups of the Lord's Supper. He went and Googled it. Google what I'm telling you if you don't believe me. Amen. Bishop Spong, that's what he said about Paul. In fact, the actions of Jesus show just the opposite. What does Acts 10.38 mean? Go to Acts 10.38. Highlight it. Circle it. I'm not kidding. Star it. Because this is very, very important. I don't care if I go more than 30 or 35 minutes because this is life and death, ladies and gentlemen. I can't afford to reduce the sermon to 30 minutes when life and death is on the line. What did he say, Acts 10, 38? Jesus, and I've taught this before, every single one who comes here should know this by heart. Jesus healed, Acts 10, 38, all who were oppressed by this devil oppressed by Satan via, by, by way of sickness and disease. Jesus has not changed. He's the same today as he was yesterday. Oppression. We, we, love, we Pentecostals love that word power. Power. Dunamis. Dunamis. That word oppression is the same word. Dunamis. Except it has that 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 a word before it, katadunamis. Katadunamis is Satan pressing his power down upon us. But Jesus is the strong man who can bind the other strong man. Amen. He's stronger than Satan. Jesus healed all who were oppressed by Satan. He healed all who came to him. He didn't change. Jesus is the same today as he was yesterday, will be tomorrow. In fact, Jesus is the only person, I love to say this, the only person to create and establish a new and better covenant 
not built upon the blood of lambs, but upon his very own blood on the cross of Calvary. Check out Hebrews. This is a new and better covenant. He's the only person to die to put this covenant into effect. Because unless there's a death, the will, the covenant don't mean anything. A trust don't mean anything as long as the testator is living. He creates this. He dies to put it into effect. And then he comes back to life to make sure that his will, his last will and covenant is carried out. Come back to life to make sure your life. We experience all the promises and benefits of the death and the life of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. That's all here in God's holy and irrevocable word. Do you get it into your system or do you go home and do you put this on your table until it gathers dust? I could go on and on and show you over and over again that this is God's will for you that you be healed. God is not now and never will be limited by what you're facing. God is only limited by one thing. What you're believing. What you're believing. What does the Bible say? Jesus could only do a few miracles in Nazareth. Why? Because of their unbelief. Are you limited? Are you limited what Jesus and God can do in your life? Because of your unbelief? Because you don't know what the Bible says about you? And therein lies the problem. What am I saying? God does not ignore us in our time of need. Listen to me. We ignore Him. God doesn't ignore us. We ignore Him. We put Him off until the last minute. And we find out, when we find out, well, the doctor can't do anything else. The medicine can't do anything else. And now we turn to God. The same God who has been convicting and convincing us all along. God says, God has a word for you today, if this is you. Stop it! And give attention to my words. Give attention to my words. When a drill sergeant in the army or the navy says, Attention! I remember this in the navy. Attention, what happens? People snap to attention. They don't look around. They snap to attention. Come on, you've seen this on TV. If you've not been in the military, they look straight ahead, listening intently to what the drill sergeant is going to say. Why? Because what he says is important. In fact, in time of war, what the drill sergeant says may save your life. This is war, ladies and gentlemen. We are living in a battleground. The church you attend is a matter of life and that the church is a, is a group of people called out to do battle in the spiritual realm. God says, give attention to my words. Listen carefully with your full attention. Don't look around. Don't look at what anyone else says or thinks. You can't look ahead and look back at the same time. These words, the words, give attention to my words. Let me tell you something. There are, I'm not an English scholar. They are in the continuous present tense you have to continually look to the word look to the word not to the right not behind you not around you proverbs 425 says this let your eyes look directly ahead and let your gaze be fixed straight ahead of you god says do not let these words depart from your sight job said this i have esteemed your words more necessary than food I have these words, Job said, are more important than food. David said, your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my pathway. God told Joshua, God's not a respecter. Look what he told Joshua. This book, I know he talked about the book of the law, but the principle is the same. This book shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate upon it day and night that you may observe to do all that is written inside of it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Who is the burden on? It's on you. It's on me. It's on all believers in the Christian church. Our bodies, ladies and gentlemen, will react 
to what we meditate on the most. What did James say? James 3, verse 4. Our tongue is like a small rudder that controls the whole ship. Words are silent killers or silent thrillers. Their brain reacts to what we tell it. How so? Do you know that from our brain, there is a network, check it out, 12 billion nerve cells and fibers run from our brain to every part of our body. Nothing within our body works without first getting a message from the brain. Some happens aut autonomously. We don't have to think about it. What do you think about most of the time? Do you think about God's word? God, how can, how, what can I do for you? You have to get God's word. Hear what God says. I find it interesting. Bear with me. Come on. I find it interesting that people will read all kinds of books about healing rather than reading the book about the healer. I find that interesting. Sad, but interesting that most individuals will know more about what the doctor says about their illness than what God says about their illness. That's why I'm saying to you, you want to be a good... Come on. Get into this Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Every time you see healing, highlight the verse. Write the word healing at the top. And then when you need a verse, you don't have to say, well, let's call Pastor Joe. Let's call this one. Let's... No, you'll have it right there in front of you. Unfortunately, most people know more about what their doctors say than what God says. Most can reel off a lab report faster than a Bible verse. You think I'm kidding you? How many can give me quick five verses on healing right now? Don't answer. There's an estimated 150,000 drugs, medical drugs on the market. Americans are filled with almost four billion prescriptions every year prescriptions every year most know more about those medicines that they take than they know about God's medicine do you know this there are over 150 scriptures in God's word that deal directly with healing 150 scriptures that deal directly with healing how many scriptures does the average believer have underlined in their Bible? Get into your Bible, ladies and gentlemen. If you do as I'm asking you to do, I promise you, by the end of this year, you'll know more about the Word than you thought you would know. How many scriptures can the average believer with an illness quote? This is life and death. I take this seriously. God is not dead and neither is His Word. It is still living and active and sharper, listen to me, than any surgeon's scalpel. The enemy knows this. The enemy knows this. Satan knows this. But he doesn't want you to know this. And that's why he keeps you from this. Because America's Got Talent is on tonight. I don't know if it is or not. I don't watch the show. Dancing with the Stars is on. I don't even know if that's still on. Because these stupid and inane things are more important. Let me tell you something. I could care less about what Britney Spears is doing right now. Or Taylor, Taylor Swift. Or what's that football guy? Whoever she's dating, I don't care. I could care less. I care more about what God would say. Psalm 103. Verse 2, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my mind, my will, and my emotions, and forget not of none of his benefits. God said that. Who heals? Who heals? He forgives your iniquities, and he heals our life. God is our healer, ladies and gentlemen. His word is medicine. No matter what your problem, no matter what the diagnosis, no matter what the situation, no matter how impossible by human standards, you need to be totally and completely convinced from the deepest part of your heart that God's will is healing and believe it beyond any shadow of doubt. That no matter what your situation, no matter how hopeless, no matter how grim, no matter how incurable or impossible it may seem, Nothing is impossible when you understand that you are a child of the Most High God and God is on your side. <clears throat> Sometimes people say, come on, just pray. 
pray good journey for this person. Come on, this person's in their 70s. They've lived a good life. Come on, they've been diagnosed with this. And the sickness is eating up their body. <clears throat> Does this Bible say anywhere that I'm a judge of when people have lived long enough? Does it say that someplace? If it were your mother, if it were your father, if it were your husband or wife, would you like me to come to your house, lay hands on you, and say, Oh, Father God, they live a long life. Oh, Father God, let these last days be peaceful and painless days. And that's not my job. My job is to pray life. Whoever speaks, let Gino, come on, man. Whoever speaks, let him speak as though it were the words of God. And let him do so with the power and strength that God provides him with. God is still God, but I know my job. And my job is to pray life and healing. Man's report, the doctor's report, is always, always limited, partial, and even fallible. How many know that? Oh, I went to the doctor. They told me I had this. Turns out I didn't have that at all. But God's word, here it is right here, is infinitely powerful, unlimited, and unchanging. There comes a time, oh, come on, that you got to believe with all your heart. In spite of the obstacles, I believe the knowledge of God is greater than the knowledge of man. I believe the word of the Lord supersedes the word of man. I believe the power of God is greater than the power of man. And the will of God for your life is written right here, the New Testament. Not written with the blood of a lamb, but written with the blood of the lamb. Jesus Christ himself with bigger and better promises for you and your life and your family and your loved ones. Promises that are not subject, and I've said this before. God's word is not subject to the laws of science. It's not subject to the laws of medicine. God's word is not subject to the laws of man or the statistics or the odds. Because this word says that Jesus Christ is not only Savior, but He's your nurturer, your provider, your protector, your deliverer, and He's your healer as well. Don't talk yourself out of what God says belongs to you. I'm almost done. Don't let negative, don't let the negative thing that's happening in your life right now be your permanent way of thinking. Don't let the valley of Darkness you're in right now hold you in chains of bondage. Psalm 107, verse, verse 14. Psalm 107, 14. Listen, I take this very seriously. I'm not an entertainer. I didn't go to school to learn entertainment. I didn't go to school to learn how to be a mortician so I can make dead people look alive. I went to school to to master God's word to the best of my ability and speak life into everybody's situation. I'm not here to tell jokes and make you feel good about yourself. This is life and death. It says that God will deliver you even from your darkest gloom. Psalm 107, 14. Break the chains that bind you and deliver you from the shadow of the death of death God has the final say so do not talk yourself out of what God says is yours is it hard at times yes absolutely it's hard absolutely it's hard but the key is to not give up your test can become for lack of a better word your testimony when you've marched around the wall six times what do you I'm too tired. I don't want to do it anymore. But the seventh time made all the difference. When your body is racked with sickness and disease, I don't want to dip in the Jordan anymore. I've dipped in there six times. But the seventh time made all the difference. Yes, it's hard to believe when you've sown and watered the same seeds over and over and over and over again. Yes. When your body is filled with pain, when your season of drought has been so long. But just because it has not happened does not mean it is not going to happen. Daniel waited 21 days. And like Daniel, you may be going through a season where it seems like all of your prayers are in vain. But the answer has already been dispatched. 
Yes. The minute you began to pray, what does the Bible say? It said the battle had turned in your favor. The minute you used words of faith and belief and began to pray, the battle turned in your favor. But the Bible says, what? Joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. When is the morning? When is the morning? The morning is at 12.01 a.m. when it's still dark outside. When the sun has not yet risen. It is still morning. The answer came for Daniel. And the answer, the deliverance, the breakthrough, the healing will come for you as well. It may take time. But God has already delivered the final verdict. Again, let me end with this. One of the covenantal names for this is covenant stuff, guys. You're not going to break the covenant. It's been around Amen. forever. You ain't going to break it. Amen. God's covenant word, Exodus 15, 6. Jehovah Rapha, I am the God who heals. What is a covenant? It is a binding agreement between two parties. God said, if you will, then I will do this. I am the Lord who heals. I am Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals, the Lord your healer. It is God's desire that we be completely healthy. Not just in our spirit, but our soul, our body, our mind, our emotions. God's will is that we be free from sin, delivered from emotional distress, and completely healed in our bodies. What does God say? Beloved, I pray above all things. God breathe that into existence. Don't lessen it. Don't put it down. I pray about all things that you prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers mentally, emotionally, spiritually. God said, here it is, I'm going to end. Give attention to my word. Give attention to my word. Incline your ears to my saying. Get these into your ears. Get them into your eyes, into your ears. What does that mean? How do you get God's word into your ears? Because God breathed this word into existence. And when you believe God, God will breathe this word back into you. When you believe, God takes this logos, this written word, and he makes it a rhema, a spoken word. Get into your eyes. God will breathe it into your ears, and then it will get down into your heart. After all he did for you, after all Jesus did for you on the cross of Calvary, considering all he wants to do for you, I don't mean to, I hope this doesn't come across disrespectful. After all he did, isn't that the least that you could do for him? Get into his word? If you do, here's God's promise. It will change your life. Amen?